Good morning. Uh, the hearing will now come to order. I want to welcome everyone to this morning's hearing. Uh, the spur for this uh, hearing was the release of a recent National Academy of Sciences report, Strengthening Forensic Science in the United States, A Path Forward. This report makes a number of recommendations on how to improve forensic science in the United States, and many of the recommendations ask for research that supports forensic science and for standards and accreditation to ensure the validity, accuracy, and reliability of forensic science testing. The purpose of today's hearing is to determine whether we can build on the resources and expertise at the National Institute of Standards and Technology to implement some of the report's recommendations. The report suggests creating an entirely new department to govern forensics issues and calls for this new agency to work with NIST. Uh, given our current economic climate and other constraints, I would first like to explore how we can build upon and improve existing federal capabilities rather than trying to create a whole new governmental structure. We uh, have all learned from the experience of creating the Department of Homeland Security that legislatively providing for a new agency is far easier and, and far different than from executing on the actual implementation of the new agency. I fully support the goal of the report to improve forensic science in the United States. The popular television show Crime Scene Investigation, or CSI, has raised public awareness and expectation of the role of forensic science in helping us to solve crimes. However, the show depicts the practice of forensics in a manner that is far different from the current state of technology or our methodology. I hope that this hearing is a first step in bringing reality into better alignment with the high expectations created by our entertainment industry. We have an experienced and distinguished panel of witnesses today. I want to thank each of you for taking the time to appear before the subcommittee and I look forward to hearing your views and advice on how to move forward from here. We all want to support law enforcement and judicial process by providing the best forensic science base available. And now I would rec like to recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Representative Smith, for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman, thank you uh, for holding this hearing today on the very important issue of forensic science. Many, if not most, of the issues we undertake in this subcommittee have direct implications well beyond our scientific and technological enterprise. For forensic science is no different, but it is certainly of particular unique importance in that it is a key factor in the fundamental functioning of our justice system. This importance has only increased in recent years through the advancement of new technologies that have enabled forensics to contribute a growing amount of information to law enforcement investigations as well as courtroom proceedings. These advances undoubtedly improved our ability to not only identify and convict the guilty, but also, very importantly, exclude the innocent. However, as the National Academy of Sciences report on strengthening forensic science demonstrates, continued improvement is necessary to maximize the quality of, and our corresponding confidence in, forensic evidence that is used in the courtroom. The NAS reports core finding that many forensic disciplines are in need of more rigorous scientific review to validate their accuracy and reliability is very serious and requires the full and immediate attention of Congress, the justice system, and certainly the forensic science community. But it is important to remember the absence of rigorous scientific underpinning in many forensic disciplines does not mean these methods are inaccurate or unreliable. It simply means they are in need of evaluation. Accordingly, I think it is important to, re to recognize the enormous value forensic evidence provides to the justice system, even in the absence of full scientific validation and accordingly exercise caution to ensure we are not overly dismissive of forensic evidence. The immediate focus of this hearing today, however, is to review the scientific and technical recommendations of the NAS report and discuss how they can best be addressed, particularly through the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which has the programs and expertise to be a key driver of improvements in, for in forensic science. I thank the witnesses for being here today and I look forward to a productive discussion. Uh, one final item, Mr. Chairman, I do have a letter from the National District Attorneys Association, and with unanimous consent, I ask that it be included in the record. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So ordered. Thank you, Mr. Smith. 
If there are any other members who wish to submit uh, additional opening statements, uh, your statements will be uh, included in the record uh, at this point. And it is my pleasure to introduce our panel of witnesses. Uh, Mr. Pete Marone is the Director of Technical Services at the Virginia Department of Forensic Science. Ms. Carol Henderson is the Director of the National Clearinghouse for Science, Technology, and Law. She is also the uh, Professor of Law at Stetson University College of Law and the past President of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. Mr. John Hicks is the retired director of the Office of Forensic Services at the New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services and the former director of the FBI Laboratory. Mr. James Downs is the Coastal Regional Medical Examiner at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. And our final witness is Mr. Peter Neufeld, who is the co-founder and co-director of the Innocence Project. Uh, Mr. Marone, if you would like to proceed, you will each have five minutes for your spoken testimony and your written testimony will be included in the record. When you complete uh, your testimony, uh, all of you complete your testimony, we will begin with questions and each member will have five minutes to question the panel. Mr. Marone, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Smith. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to this committee. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Marone, and I, I have gotten a promotion since then. I'm a director of the Commonwealth of Virginia's Department of Forensic Science now, uh, and, and was a member of the committee identifying the needs of the forensic science community. Of course, this was a study that, that NIJ funded at the request of the Senate Appropriations Committee, but it was really requested quite heavily by the forensic science community to make it happen. Um, in the testimony today, what I'd like to do is shorten and simplify all the recommendations of the, of the, uh, of the uh, committee uh, and specify or, or, or spend the time on four particular issues, um, uh, classes in, in the, um, the full potential of the, of the program. Uh, break it into uh, scientific and technical challenges that must be met in order for forensic science enterprise to, to proffer, to, to uh, reach its, uh, boy, I'm messing up badly, uh, full potential. <clears throat> I'd like to break it into four categories. Uh, the first being uh, funding, resources, if you will, research, uh, standardization, and education. The first element really uh, is probably one of the most important and was not specifically addressed as a recommendation by the committee, and that's the resource issue. Uh, Although they, we didn't address it as, a, as a, uh, a particular criteria, it was very, very understood by the committee that for the state and local laboratories, there was a lack of resources, whether it be money, staffing, training, or equipment, necessary to promote and maintain strong forensic science systems. As you're ac are acutely aware right now, states are now in a fiscal crisis. I would submit that laboratories and medical examiner's offices have been in a fiscal crisis for a number of years. This is nothing new for us. Uh, Further, the funding from the federal government has really been focused overwhelmingly to one discipline, and that's DNA. Uh, what I would like to say as an individual is make it very clear that we are asking for funding for the full breadth of the forensic science disciplines, but not to the exclusion of DNA. And that, in other words, we are saying very clearly, don't take the DNA money and give it to everybody else. Keep all the disciplines funded and supported. I want to make that very, very clear because in, in a lot of issues, there, this, that's a misunderstanding. Under the category of research, the committee determined that the forensic science disciplines need further research to provide the proper underlying validation for some of the methods in use and to provide the basis for more precise statements about their reliability and precision. The report clearly states that there is a value in many of the disciplines addressed but the forensic community itself has been stating for more than a decade, in order to accomplish this, we need more funding for research and a stronger, broader research base. The disciplines based on biological or chemical analysis, such as toxicology, drug analysis, some trace evidence disciplines, uh, such as uh, explosives, fire debris, paint, and fiber analysis, are all well, uh, well validated and shouldn't be in the same category as the experience-based disciplines, such as fingerprints, firearms, and tool marks, 
and other pattern recognition types of analysis. We need studies, for instance, uh, that look on a large population of fingerprints and tool marks just to qualify how many sources might share similar features. Similarly, we need more research uh, on the issues of context effect and examiner bias. Uh, in standardization, for example, one of the issues was that laboratories need to be mandatorily accredited. During our, re during our reviews, we found that uh, there's approximately 400 laboratories, uh, publicly funded laboratories in the United States, but 320 of them are already accredited. So it's not like the laboratories aren't espousing this idea. And the same thing for the not mandatory certification. There's a significant number of individuals who are voluntarily being certified. The primary conclusion was that the forensic science enterprise doesn't have a unified plan. It needs strong, fresh national direction. Strong, strong leadership is needed to adopt and promote aggressive long-term agenda to strengthen forensic science. Our report strongly urges Congress to establish a new independent institute of forensic science to lead the research ever, efforts, establish and enforce standards for forensic science professionals, and oversee education. Now, I understand that uh, NIST serves that purpose to a certain extent, and we all agree that NIST does serve a very important purpose. It does have expertise in standardization and experience in a number of those types of, uh, of issues for establishing a coherent uh, laboratory practices and reporting professionalism, codes of ethics, and so forth. What NIST doesn't have is all the package. And, and as, as the committee uh, reviewed all the uh, existing entities, nobody has the global experience necessary to complete the package, to give all the planning. There are bits and pieces in every one of them. Nobody has that. And, and the key is that whatever entity this is has to be something that is n new in the sense that the fear is if you put it in an existing entity or under an existing agency, they will tend to create the new entity in their own image and likeness, if you will. In other words, they'll continue doing things the way they do, and what we really need is fresh thinking, new thoughts, new issues to be addressed. I'll finish up quite quickly here now. <coughs> Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to come here today. I'd like to conclude by quoting a part of our study which I believe is one of the most important statements and findings we had. Numerous professionals in the forensic science community and the medical examiner system have worked for years to achieve excellence in their fields, aiming to follow high ethical norms, develop sound professional standards, ensure accurate results in their practices, and improve the processes by which accuracy is determined. Although the work of these dedicated professionals has resulted in significant progress in the forensic science disciplines in recent de decades, major challenges still face the forensic science community. I thank you for your time. I'll be pleased to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Marone. Uh, Ms. Henderson, please proceed. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Okay. Um, as I was already introduced, um, but I wanted to mention that as the director of the National Clearinghouse for Science, Technology, and the Law, um, the, we have created the only searchable database in the world of law, science, and technology uh, information. Um, I, as you mentioned, I'm also a professor of law and the immediate past president of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, and in fact, two of the officers of the Academy are here in the audience today. As an assistant United States attorney with extensive experience, I was also a founder of the Florida Innocence Project, and I have more than 20 years of involvement in teaching and scholarly writing on the interface of science and law. I'm well aware of the importance of forensic science to the justice system, and the nexus between science and law is critical to forensic science. We therefore have to recognize that the forensic overhaul, which has been desired by the NAS committee with extensive work, and I did go to four of the five hearings that they had, it requires a collaboration of all of the stakeholders, attorneys and judges, crime laboratory and technical personnel, and the civil expert witnesses as well. Um, I believe we've been really presented with an opportunity to make forensic science serve justice even more reliably and effectively. This is the time to build better forensic science, but we must be realistic in regard to the urgency of acting now and not permitting defects identified in the report to go unaddressed. Yet we have to make the best use of available resources and go forward in a measured and considered manner that creates sound and lasting systems. 
I'm therefore recommending a three-step approach. One is immediate action using existing federal resources to address scientific standard. Two, we need interim action, which will evaluate strategic policy decisions and strategies and explore innovative solutions. Vision is needed. And then a long-term goal of creating a National Institute of Forensic Sciences as envisioned by the committee. Um, the urgent action, which I'm going to go to first, is making the best use of our existing resources. Many of the issues that were identified in the report concern scientific foundation of disciplines and subdisciplines in forensic science. The concerns range from, and I quote, are these techniques fundamentally unsound, to while there's a body of evidence that the techniques are of value, there is a lack of validation to the degree that it has been established in the introduction of DNA testing. There is an existing federal agency well suited to the task, namely the National Institute of Standards and Technology. This is where we can begin. NIST has a national role in, prom in promoting scientific standards and has made significant contributions to the core science in several areas of forensic science, although not all areas of forensic science. Then I'd like to move on to the interim action. We need to implement a program to address policy issues and focus on innovative processes. And these include, and I have to echo um, Pete, we need research, much more of it. We need education, and it's not just of the people who are in the crime laboratories, but of lawyers and judges. We need, of course, to continue accreditation and credentialing. Uh, we cannot be bridged with a Band-Aid, and I brought crime scene Band-Aids to show you all, okay? You can have one later, all right? But it's true. This is, a Band-Aid is not going to solve this problem, but a bridge will. And I think that's one thing that we have to look at. Those, so these interim issues must be addressed. Um, and in fact, notably, I have to tell you, there are very few papers that are regarding forensic science policy out there. And that is something else that needs to be addressed as well. There's no established forensic equivalent to think tanks like the Aspen Institute. And my objective in discussing these interim objectives with you is to emphasize how important they are and the need for carefully thought out policy and strategic planning. The long-term action to create a NIFS, um, and I am very familiar with NIFS in Australia. It took them 20 years to get off the ground. And I talked to Alistair Ross, who is now the interim director, who was the original director there, and I talked to him last night. And many of the recommendations say this is great to have an oversight and coordinating body. Um, but you really have to be practical, and I have to say that's one thing I am is practical. This committee knows all too well the lengthy, you know, consultative processes that will have to be undertaken if the government chooses to pursue creating a NIFS in the United States. The process will not be instant and will, as with the interim issues that we discussed above, benefit from careful analysis of both policy, strategic planning, and implementation factors. All right, so now I'd like to talk about the overhaul, which is what was recommended in the NAS report. And this is more general considerations based on my personal experience both as a law professor, a federal prosecutor, and past president of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, although I'll mention I'm not here as a spokesperson for the academy. Only the president or the um, president-elect can speak. The lack of academic freedom in research and development results in a stifling of forensic science. As long as the overwhelming body um, of forensic science does not challenge itself or respond to the voices of all of its stakeholders, especially the legal community, which is its pr primary stakeholder, we won't move forward. I do have great hope, though, for forensic science. In fact, my theme while I was the president was forensic science envisioning and creating the future. AAFS, I have to tell you, has recognized education, credentialing, accreditation, and has we actually raised more than $300,000 last year for forensic science research because I knew, and I think all of us knew, it was a priority. Um, and we have really welcomed the NAS report, and under President Tom Bohan, who's in the audience here, we will continue to champion changes to the forensic landscape. So how do we make significant changes? We can draw an analogy with the race to the moon. The space age had catastrophes, just like forensic science, but its successes came because there was a stretching but achievable goal, and scientists and engineers at NASA could apply themselves to delivering successful outcomes. Give forensic science the same target, and we'll see even more progress than has been achieved so far. Challenge the status quo is as important as a unified commitment to a clear set of objectives and a strategic plan. We must identify innovative approaches. It's very key to be strategic. Innovation is a cultural issue as much as one of the infrastructure, and a case can be illustrated by comparison to the medical model of education and research. Medical schools in top-tier universities act as centers of excellence. 
and a second opinion is allowed, in fact, expected. Um, by contrast, forensic science sometimes responds defensively to criticism and, res and regards requests for a second opinion as a slight and not as a tool to encourage interaction with stakeholders. I have to say, um, Representative Gordon, the chairman of the House Committee on Science and Technology, has reminded us scientific progress occurs when we foster the open exchange of ideas and information. That's excellent advice and could form the basis of a goal of collaboration between all our stakeholders. And President Obama has also pledged to place science at the top of the national agenda, commitment, and that is something we in forensic science embrace. And I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to address you and your serious consideration of the report. Thank you, Ms. Hendrickson. Mr. Hicks, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the uh, subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here to, to uh provide some of my own perspectives on this uh, whole study uh, today. As uh, Mr. Marone did, I tried to group the uh, 13 recommendations of the National Academy of Sciences study into four categories. My categories are very similar to his, uh, uh, the first category being methods development and standardization. I think that's probably the most critical area that is where the, is, the needs are severe right now. Uh, the other category, laboratory accreditation and quality assurance, the third category, research and training, and the fourth, resource requirements. In those latter three categories, Congress has already undertaken a number of initiatives that have helped the laboratories considerably, the DNA uh, backlog programs and the Paul Coverdell uh, forensic science program. And my experience uh, working with New York State over the last eight years, we have 22 laboratories operating within that state, and I can tell you that uh, each of those laboratories benefits substantially from that and rely on those funds to, uh, to continue to to continue to improve their programs and operations. So they are critical programs, and I would hope that they were, would be continued. Um, of course, the confidence of DNA technology uh, was uh, brought about in large part, again, because of the underlying uh, developmental work that was done. We were fortunate at the time that that uh, work did take place, that uh, it was a brand new technology. It was uh, quickly recognized the significance and importance of the technology for forensic science. And so we had many agencies come together, the, the FBI, the uh, National Institute of Justice, and NIST, uh, among those agencies uh, working with academicians and others around the country, uh, spent an enormous number of hours trying to work and address the various many issues. It wasn't efficient, but it did seem to get us to the right place in the, uh, in the end. Uh, of course, the committee, uh, the National Academy Committee, expressed uh, concerns, again, as Mr. Marone pointed out, with a lot of pattern recognition types of things, uh, firearms identification, uh, uh, fingerprint matching, and so forth. Uh, I think it's significant to note that NIST has uh, played an important role in those functions. They, they did a big study with respect, not only with respect to DNA technology, but did a huge study with respect to the automated fingerprint identification system, which helped to identify the standards to help the system work more efficiently. And of course, that's a system relied upon every minute of every day by every police department in the country to, uh, to carry out its work. Uh, they've also uh, performed a very helpful study with respect to a firearms database system to capture fired ammunition components and uh, the, the image data from the markings on those uh, bullets and data. And that's uh, resulted in what's now called the NIBIN, the National Integrated Ballistics Identification Network. And it's used widely by firearms examiners around the country. It's a good screening tool to help, again, to maybe generate leads in, in ongoing investigations. So NIST has played an important role in those two. Of course, NIST, with respect to the toxicology and uh, the chemistry and the just general analytical services, NIST uh, routinely provides uh, standards that are used for traceability of, uh, and quality control purposes within those operations. Um, from my perspective, I think the NIST, uh, an expanded role for NIST in area, represents the most effective and efficient way to bring about needed improvements in the forensic community. It would bring focus and it would draw on their core competencies, which of course relate to standards development and, and uh, validation of work. I suspect there's a lot of work out there that uh, if uh, uh, brought together, uh, or existing work out there, brought together and sort of examined closely in great scrutiny, then maybe uh, some additional studies put together to kind of round out the available data. I suspect that uh, many of the troublesome answers that, or troublesome questions that uh, the Academy report found might be addressed uh, fairly, uh, fairly quickly uh, through an organization like NIST. It would be helpful, of course, for NIST to, uh, I think the DNA model, while uh, not necessarily all that efficient, it did uh, draw on, again, collaboration between uh, federal agencies that have some competencies in this area and have connections with the community. I think it would be very important, of course, for uh, NIST to expand its relationship with the forensic community. 
Uh, one of the things that has evolved over the last few years have been what are called scientific working groups, and these are typically uh, the experts in different disciplines are brought together, and, uh, and they share their concerns and questions and issues that come up, and it's been a very productive way to help promote standards. In fact, many of those groups have defined their own, um, uh, started putting together information that helps define what the, uh, what the operating standards and procedures should be for their for their disciplines. But what would be helpful is to expose that to some good, heavy, rigorous scientific scrutiny as well. Um, so I think I'll conclude with that. I, as I said, my, my perspective is that NIST uh, provides uh, uh, an opportunity here for to, to really help in the area which I think is the greatest need, and that is focusing on the standards development and the standardization aspects. Thank you very much, Mr. Hicks. Thanks. Dr. Downs, please proceed. Chairman Wu, distinguished committee members, it is indeed an honor and a privilege to be before you today. I speak today as a GBI employee, a board certified forensic pathologist, former director of the Alabama Department of Forensic Sciences, where I saw firsthand a lab system go from square one to full accreditation while facing a crushing backlog. Most importantly, I speak as a son who lost a mother suddenly and had to wait for answers. And when those answers came, it left many in my family with more questions than solace. I think the take-home lesson from the NRC report is nothing we didn't already know. For years, we had seen the initially maligned discipline of forensic DNA identification benefit from a focused look on the potential and the shortcomings of the science. Although some might have been skeptical, especially at first, the end result was wide acceptance of the reliability and the validity of DNA science. We, within the rest of the forensic system, eagerly sought an independent assessment of where we all stood. The NRC report is, as Paul uh, Harvey would say the rest of the story. Overall, we're doing well, but there is some room for improvement. Of the recommendations in the report, there is a little bit of agreement on almost everything. Most involved in the process feel standardization of reports and terminology, uh, research into underlying principles and validity, addressing potential bias and error, establishment of testable metrics, proficiency testing, accreditation certification, quality assurance, ethics, enhanced forensic education, database interoperability are all good things. The question today is how NIST might fit into the forensics picture. Certainly, I don't think anybody would doubt the technical merits of, of NIST and their track record of unparalleled success in regards to analytical laboratory standards. Their greatest strength lies in the accuracy and precision, the metrics of testing. The NRC specifically reaches out, as it should, to NIST to partner in relevant areas where such measurement and testing are key considerations. Thus, in areas like standardization research, underlying principles, validity, a potential bias and error, et cetera, NIST can and should be involved. However, the day-to-day -day application of forensic testing means working with less than optimal and highly variable case-specific evidence and trying to obtain, obtain the best possible test results, then reporting those findings to the appropriate entities. NIST is primarily a laboratory science body which is, does not fit well into the NRC call for significant research in the entirety of the forensics realm. The NIST excellence in laboratory standards and metrics does not translate well into the larger issues of accreditation and certification, practitioner professionalism, or administrative areas, nor quite honestly is there likely to be buy-in from the forensic practitioners if they did become more involved. We already have accreditation and certification. We have standard operating procedures in place. I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. Another concern that I have is, unfortunately, I think that NIST lacks an established history with regards to the complexities and intricacies of interactions of law enforcement, legal, and governmental issues so vital to the effectiveness of the forensic system as a whole. A related question would be exactly under what branch of government is there a best fit for forensics? An important point here, uh, while we may be scientists, those who use our reports are oftentimes not. They're judges, prosecutors, defense counsel, police, sheriffs, and civilians. They all share one key concern. They want an accurate, reliable answer, and they want it quickly. These customers have different, sometimes not entirely interrelated needs. Does the investigative aspect of law enforcement needs or the adversarial tenor of the court determine how a case is to be analyzed? Unfortunately, questions are far easier than answers. The, the same NRC that had this report called for professionalization of, for, professionalization of forensics specifically death investigation before, through the National Academies, the last time in 2003, but also a little further back, 1928, and again in 1932. 
Perhaps this isn't surprising to see uh, that change is slow to come. After all, what's 80 years that we've been waiting compared to an office, that specifically the coroner, that dates to the 900s and was reformed in 1194? Those who live in the past are destined to stay there. I think the NRC was wise in recognizing that none of their goals, however well-intentioned, can come about overnight. There are ser serious challenges, both jurisdictional and legal, to overcome. Independence is also an important consideration. Within my agency, we are operationally independent, as it should be and as the text of the NRC report clearly defines. I have testified many times before from the stand, I am neither pro-prosecution nor pro-defense. I am pro-truth. I don't have a dog in the fight. The adversaries in the courtroom are the attorneys. I'm their guest. In closing, I think the path forward for all forensic sciences as outlined in the National Academy of Sciences report is best served by that old adage, good enough seldom is. The American people deserve better. And I think perhaps Sir William Gladstone best summed it up, quote, show me the manner in which a nation cares for its dead and I will measure with ma mathematical exactness the tender mercies of its people, their respect for the laws of the land and their loyalty to high ideals. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Downs. Mr. Neufeld, please proceed. Good morning, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, uh, my name is Peter Neufeld. I'm the co-founder and co-director of the Innocence Project. And certainly, I'll be the first to admit, if it wasn't for DNA, I wouldn't be here. And there would be no Innocence Project, because it was DNA that's responsible for the exoneration of 233 men and women in this country who were wrongly convicted. Unfortunately, uh, our research into these cases suggests that 50% of them were wrongly convicted because of the use of either an unvalidated or improper forensic science testimony at their original trials. Um, and it's our familiarity with DNA which leads me to take issue with some of the remarks made by some of the other speakers. The underlying success and virtue of DNA and its robustness does not come primarily from the fact that the FBI or NIJ or NIST worked on tweaking it to make it more user-friendly in the crime labs in America. The underlying robustness of DNA comes from the fact that for 20 years before it was ever used in a courtroom, DNA was being uh, broadly researched, uh, uh, applied research, basic research uh, for research laboratories, for uh, medical applications of DNA, and that's the uniqueness of DNA, if you will, with respect to these other forensic disciplines that come under such harsh, harsh criticism in the NAS report. That these other disciplines were created first and foremost for law enforcement. And so they never went through that kind of basic or applied research that DNA enjoyed. And for our clients, our exonerees, the, the findings of the NAS report are not a total surprise. We knew about this anecdotally, but fortunately it was the NES report that looked at it methodically and scientifically and arrived at the conclusions that it reached. And one of the key conclusions that it reached is that, quote, with the exception of nuclear DNA analysis, however, no forensic method has been rigorously shown to have the capacity to consistently and with a high degree of certainty demonstrate a connection between evidence and a specific individual or source. That's, that's the finding of the report. And to us, that's not a surprise because so many of our clients were, ex were, were, were convicted because of less than reliable or less than validated forensic science. I hold out Kennedy Brewer as an example. He's mentioned in the written testimony. Kennedy Brewer was convicted because of a bite mark expert in Mississippi uh, said that uh, uh, insect marks on this little three-year-old girl's body were not only bite marks, but were bite marks that came from Kennedy Brewer to the exclusion of everybody on the planet. Uh, years later, even though this man was sentenced to death for a crime he didn't commit, DNA on the semen recovered from her not only exonerated him, but identified the real perpetrator, a man named Justin Albert Johnson. And the sad thing in this case is that 18 months earlier, another three-year-old girl was killed in the same community. And once again, the same bite mark expert said that uh, someone named LaVon Brooks was responsible for those bite marks and therefore must have been responsible for that murder. Justin Albert Johnson was nearly suspect in another case, but because of the bite mark evidence, everybody ignored Mr. Johnson and focused on the wrong person. Every time the 
police department or the forensic scientists focus on the wrong person, the real bad guy is still out there, as in this case, committing other horrible crimes. In this case, it was a rape and murder of a three-year-old girl. What we have found in the 230 exonerations are 100 instances where the real perpetrator uh, was ultimately identified. And during those intervening years, the real perpetrator committed many serious murders and violent rapes. So when we're talking about making reforms here, we're talking about not only helping the wrongly convicted, we're helping about improving public safety for all Americans. And when people say that, oh, this is old science, they should know that we tried to do an informal survey here, and we found out that there's still two to 300 of these bite mark experts in the last four or five years who are testifying in these kinds of cases. Look at Brendan Mayfield, and look at the language in, in this report on fingerprint examination. And what it says in the report is that the ACE-5 does not guard against bias, is too broad to ensure repeatability and transparency, and does not guarantee that two analysts following it will obtain the same results. Well, no wonder two FBI agents in the Brendan Mayfield case swore on affidavits that they were 100% certain that the, that the fingerprints on the, uh, on the uh, bombing device bag in, in Madrid came from this attorney named Mayfield. But they were 100% wrong. The problem is, when you look at the language in the NAS report, if you were not looking at forensic science, but instead you were looking at medicine, you would outlaw those products, or you would pull them from the shelf. But historically, we've always had this double standard for forensic science on the one hand and medical science on the other. And that's what the NAS report set out to address, to treat it with the same kind of rigor. And wherever you decide to place this thing, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, the key principles are there has to be an aggressive research agenda, something that's always been lacking in forensic science. There has to be an oversight entity concerned with validity and reliability, something that's always been lacking in forensic science. There has to be some government oversight of quality assurance, of accreditation, of certification. If those recommendations are implemented, you will have science-based prosecutions. You will have fewer wrongful convictions, and you will have a robust forensic science industry that becomes an incubator for innovation and technology, not just in the United States, but throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Norfeld. Um, before we get, uh, we are now in the uh, question and comment period of uh, the hearing, and uh, uh, the chairman first uh, recognizes himself for five minutes. Um, before we get to other crucial issues, like level of support, level of funding, whether to create a new independent um, agency or to um, perhaps <coughs> approach that in a different way, and in transition issues, it seems to me there may be some disagreement or at least difference in emphasis among the witnesses um, about the current state of forensic science. Um, when I hit my first memo on this topic, uh, I have to say that I was a little bit stunned. Uh, one of the sentences uh, in that memo said, with the exception of DNA matching, the commonly used forensic tests such as fingerprint analysis, ballistic testing, uh, hair matching, pattern recognition, and paint matching are based more on workers' experience than on rigorous scientific protocols. And I had the same reaction to that sentence that I did when I was visiting my local medical school and they were discussing evidence-based medicine. Uh, I had a very brief exposure to medical school in my training days, and uh, my first reaction was, gee, I thought all the stuff y'all did uh, was evidence-based. Uh, you know, <laughs> let's, let's start a square run. It took me a while to understand evidence-based medicine and what they were getting at. Uh, perhaps the panel for our edification could discuss with me or with us uh, your concerns about whether there is a sound scientific basis for many of the tests that, are, that we commonly rely on in our forensic testing. Um, 
and I don't know if we want to go from right to left, left to right, or whether any of you want to uh, proceed. But m Mr. Neufeld, uh, and forgive me, I, I'm reverting to my old Germanic past. I, I pronounce your name Neufeld. Uh, Your, your, your microphone? I'm not a scientist, and I'm not the best person to answer your question, but these individuals who are on this panel all have obviously their own subjective experience uh, and also their own special disciplines in the case of some of them, which they may or may not wish to defend. The point of the, of the National Academy report, however, is it is, a, it is a blue ribbon body of some of the best minds, uh, not just in the forensic science community, but in the hard sciences. Uh, as opposed to, the, you know, the, in the basic sciences, which are not represented in this panel right now before you, with the exception of the, uh, the eminent physician who is sitting to my right. And, um, and what I will say is it was their conclusion uh, that it was lacking, and we can't simply uh, ignore that conclusion that it's based on a two-year study that they did. Well, uh I, realizing that you're not a scientist, uh, perhaps we come back to you at some point and uh, you could address some, uh, um, uh, either examples or analytically what would be different if there were a um, scientific basis to some of the forensics works that we do, the forensic work that we do. Uh, Dr. Downs, uh, would you care to address this issue? Does this make a difference or does it not? Or is, is, there, is there a problem here? Mr. Chairman, I think it's a great question, and your model of evidence-based medicine, I think, is, is dead on. In fact, in my written comments, I address the whole source of that, which was the Flexner Report back at the turn of the last century. And, and, and the question here is whether we are at a similar inflection point for, if you will, a slightly different profession, uh, just as the Flexner Report and the reforms of American medical education made a significant difference. It, it, is there a need to do something that dramatic in this field at this point in time? I think for the sake of public confidence that the analogy I use is a race car driver. Uh, they can win championships on the track. They have to go back now and get their driver's license and prove that they can do what we already know they can do very, very well. And I think there is good science behind all of the testing that we do. The problem is we kind of got ahead of it, and we never went back because, it, as uh, Mr. Neufeld correctly points out, it came through a different venue. It came through law enforcement and the courts, and the courts never asked us for that scientific basis as a starting point. We know it works. Uh, that analogy is very helpful, but let, uh, walk me through this with some specificity. What kind of difference would it make if we were to bring scientific or analytical rigor if you will, rather than the contrast with experiential work that we uh, perhaps have, have approached, the experiential approach with which we've brought to this in the past. How does one make a call on a fingerprint? How many specific points in a fingerprint are required to call that a match? In the past, that's been based purely on experience. When the examiner reaches a certain comfort level, they make the call. We don't have a way, a metric, to say it takes 10 points of identification, 20 points. So there's no scientific basis for where that line is. And if we are to apply the standards, like we do in medicine, to say, OK, we have these test results. Therefore, we can, with confidence, make this call, that's, I think, what we're trying to, to get to. Do any of the other witnesses want to address this point? Uh, Mr. Moran. Mr. Chairman, I think to say we need additional research is, is the key, additional research. What, what has happened in the past is research has been done at any number of levels, usually by the practitioners, the, the people working in the field, whether it be for firearms identification or fingerprints. Uh, and I'll use firearms examination uh, uh, as the first example. There have been a number, literally probably hundreds of studies where individuals have taken 10 sequentially manufactured barrels to see just how close they look before we do anything to them and can we still differentiate them even though they've come off the assembly line one after the other. But the key is those studies haven't been broad enough 
or have looked at enough issues, statistically analyzed, maybe they didn't answer all the questions that, that, that uh, an individual would want, and so we need to take those same kind of studies, broaden them, make sure that all the questions, issues, variables are answered, and that would give you the, the scientific basis. So a lot of the work is out there, it just hasn't answered all the questions, but what I can say is of all the work that's been, all the research that's been done in fingerprinting, all the research been done, that's been done in firearms identification, nothing has led anyone to believe that it, that it isn't proper, that it can't be done, which if, if you're gonna truly look at it scientifically, that's, that's a two-edged sword. Just because there isn't full validation, you can't jump to the conclusion that it's empirically wrong. Uh, when you do have some research that indicates that there is some, you just need more work. So I think that's where we are. There is a lot of research that's been done. A lot of it hasn't been published. They're out in technical notes and so forth. And it needs to come up that same level of rigor uh, in peer-reviewed journals and so forth so that everyone can look at it, try to reproduce it, and, and so forth. So I, that, that, I think, is the issue, is that we need to make that research that has been done more broad-based and more, and more really tuned to what exactly the question is. Mr. Chairman, can I respond to that for one second, because I do disagree. Uh, y yes, uh, a response here, and then I intend to return to this issue because it's a core issue, but I'm a few minutes over my time, and with Mr. Smith's forbearance, go, my, go my, ahead. My, my understanding ahead. of the scientific okay. method, and I am not an expert in it, I don't have a postdoc in it, is the burden is on the proponent of any scientific hypothesis to prove that it's right. It's not, it's not our burden to show that what they're doing is wrong, okay? They have to make out sufficient basis to demonstrate that something has been scientifically validated. That's number one. Number two, uh, in response to what Dr. Downs said, could you imagine in a medical context, because he was talking about fingerprints, if 10 different examiners looked at the same cells and had 10 different definitions as to whether they were simply abnormal as opposed to malignant, how could we have confidence in medicine if we had that range of opinion? It wouldn't work in medicine. It can't work in forensic science. Well, well Mr. Northfeld, uh, I may not have a full understanding of medical science, but my impression is that um, with guidance from other sources, that actually is what happens in imaging. That is, you see a pattern of shadows and light and, uh, you know, based on 10, 100, 1,000 reads, uh, you develop uh, patterns and they become more analytically accurate with additional data, but, it, but ultimately it is a, a match against that background. But you wouldn't expect that there would be 20 different opinions on the same data looked at by 20 different analysts. I, okay, and that's, that's the difference that I'm talking about. And, and that, I'm, that's absolutely correct. You would not hope for 20 different opinions, but, right, but, but you might get two very different opinions from two, very, from two different readers. I, I understand that. And, and, and the, 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 uh, the third point of this is, is as follows. You know, uh, what you did have in medicine uh, at the early part of the 20th century was a commitment to sort of revolutionize and transform medicine in this country. You had the creation of the National Institutes of Health, with a very, very ambitious uh, research agenda. And we have never had anything, I'm not even talking about trying to do something as complex as that or as, as grand as that, but you've never had a kind of freestanding research agenda for forensic science, not just to validate that which is already out there, if it indeed can be validated, but also to encourage, okay, as, as I'm sure this committee is concerned with, that kind of incubator for new technology, for new forensic science. What's gonna be the next DNA, the next truth machine that we can build an industry around that'll be very successful, not only in helping forensic science, but also in helping commerce and, and, and exporting it. You know, we, we want a research agenda that can do all of those things, and it's sorely lacking at this point. Uh, we will come, we will return to this issue, and I'll be asking tougher questions of the other perspective on this. Uh, Mr. Smith. Well, I, I think that given the presence of other members here, we want to uh, get around and uh, in the, in the um, interest of fairness, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, please proceed. I'm reining myself in. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, when it, for all of the witnesses, the entire panel here, if you wish to, to respond, certainly there are a lot of technical recommendations in the report. Um, what would stand out to you as the highest priority, if you wouldn't mind? Starting with Mr. Moreau. I don't think you have a single highest priority. They're, they're very much leveled, if you will. Uh, if you look at establishing maybe a priority based on what can be attained first, not easiest, but with least problematic uh, issues, uh, uh, moving on the accreditation and certification, certification of individuals, accreditation of laboratories. Those are two already vibrant, rigorous programs that are out there and can achieve uh, significant gains in the community. S uh, the certification for the individuals and the accreditation because even though I said that, you know, almost 85, 90 percent of the laboratories are already accredited, one of the other issues that are out there are the other service providers. These are the, uh, an ID section in a police department where they do fingerprint comparison. You know, there's not that much accreditation or certification out there. Certification to a certain extent, but there's not that much accreditation out there. So by, by taking that first uh, along with, uh, and then education, and somewhere in there you have to put in resources because we can train individuals, we can certify the individuals, but if they don't have the equipment or the people to, to provide the analysis at the other end, then we're at mixed purposes. So your question, I'm not trying to, go around the circle is we kind of need them all uh, and they are separate lines uh, that can be done in parallel. Uh, the accreditation, the resources. Laboratories are just up to their eyeballs in casework. Uh, we've got to fix that and it's not a, a quick fix of well we give them a whole bunch of money for overtime or we outsource to private laboratories or so forth because that only fixes it now and then two years from now we're right back in the same uh, situation. So the resource issues, the accreditation certification goes a long way towards a lot of these other issues as far as competency, effectiveness of the analysis and so forth. Uh, you, you look at a lot of the recommendations and they can really be uh, subsumed into to, uh, one, all the quality control issues into accreditation and certification. Uh, those are all can be covered by by those programs. So I would I would place those first, and then education, and, and certainly resources. You pick which one you want to do first. Uh, any estimate of cost? <laughs> uh, if I had that answer, I wouldn't be here right now speaking in the capacity I am. I'd probably you know have a global uh, uh, conglomerate going uh, answering that question to everybody. Uh, you know we, we we look at what's happened in DNA and the modest, relatively modest now. Uh, uh, amount of money that's gone to DNA analysis. In the five years that it's been, we've seen tremendous progress as far as capacity enhancement and backlog reduction. And really, let's not worry about how much actually was in the appropriations, how much money made to the laboratories, and it was probably, probably $50 million, maybe $60 million a year, and yet we saw progress. It's still not enough, but we saw progress. So multiply that by all the other disciplines, you know, you know I hesitate to throw a figure out because then somebody runs with it, you know, and, and everybody's throwing out trillions of dollars now. I don't think we have any idea what this cost may be. Certainly accreditation, several million dollars for accreditation, you know, anywhere between five and 50 uh, to make the accreditation happen. Uh, what you need, and that's not counting the cost from the laboratory's perspective as to the time that they must spend preparing for that. Same thing for certification. We have no, I have no idea how many, uh, how much it might cost, but it's, you know, it's, it's a large figure if that helps you. Uh, it has, you know, we, we batted that around in the committee and it's like, there's no way to do that. You have to first find out what the issues are before you can figure out what it's gonna cost, what the numbers are. And we have yet to define the number of service providers outside forensic laboratories. How many PD ID units are there and so forth? Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Um, I think what we really need to do is do a strategic plan. And I think this is my learned colleague at the end of the table and 
on this end of the table as well. One of the things that we need to do is what are our priorities? And I think that's, you know, they listed things, they have recommendations, but there is no strategic plan put forth. And I think that is very critical. And also I have to say with Peter, research is critical. If we don't know what's going on in all the different disciplines, and this is what's interesting about forensic science, we are a multidisciplinary group. We're not like anything else. We're not like medicine, um, although we have, you know, forensic pathologists like Jamie um, with us, but we have so many different diverse groups within forensic science. But a lot of research could be done, and in fact, that's where you take the institutions, for example, you could use universities and work in conjunction with laboratories, because the laboratories are taxed. They have, they're overtaxed with many things that they have to do. And I think, uh, Pete's true, we don't know how much money this is going to cost. We have to take a look. What is in existence? And that's why I said, let's start with some immediate action. Like, what can we do with existing things that are in place, like accreditation and like certification programs? There are quite a few of them. And then work from there to improve identify the research priorities, and then move forward. I think that would be practical, um, which is one of the things in this economy we need to be. Thank you. Dr. Downs? I think uh, I agree with what my predecessors have said. I would also say I think that as a practical matter, given that the courts are relying on this fingerprint evidence and firearms evidence, for example, and the other pattern evidence, that we have to validate that for those purposes, for courtroom purposes, because that evidence is already in process. And we have people waiting for trial. Uh, we need to address that issue, I think, as, as one of those initial priorities. Mr. Hicks? I'd just like to voice my agreement, too, to all that's been said here so far. I think it's um, uh, the elements are there to draw upon, you know, to, to enhance and to draw upon to, uh, to help address some of the critical questions that have been raised. And I suspect uh, much of that information is there. It just needs to be put into a package and a form and then subjected to scientific scrutiny that would be helpful uh, for the courts. But it, you ought to it ought to be recognized, I think, the context of how some of these uh, now called sciences evolve, fingerprints and firearms identification, fiber identification, things like that. I mean, the, this was all investigative uh, techniques. These were undertaken to try to help bring some information about uh, in a criminal event that's taken place. So one of the first roles that the crime laboratories had written initially had to face was uh, just simply identifying the white powdery substance as, uh, as a controlled substance, meeting the critical element of the law. So, so that, of course, evolved into chemists being hired at the laboratory. But prior to that, uh, the, the question of trying to reconstruct the criminal event and trying to then test the what can be observed at the crime scene, based uh, uh, test that against the statements of, of witnesses that may be there, and try, again trying to assess and reconstruct just exactly what took place uh, before it's then uh, decided whether there are any charges to be brought and then how that would be proceed in court. So consequently, a lot of the development, particularly of the pattern type recognition, the observation type things, such as fingerprints. Uh, such as firearms identification and other things like that, uh, evolved in uh, police departments, probably from investigative personnel as much as not so much scientists. And then, but as I, uh, in, in my estimation, uh, through the years, uh, through organizations and, and uh, uh, w for forensic science organizations and through, as these uh, individual techniques have, have evolved, uh, the agencies have brought in people with scientific backgrounds as they've recognized that need. Uh, they probably were surprised when they first arrived at the level of uh, sort of scientific underpinnings were there. And I think there has been a lot of work done by a lot of people to try to address and, and uh, assure themselves that they're offering opinions confidently in their, in their individual cases. But so that's where I think, again, this would, uh, would have the, uh, again, as a short-term, efficient, quick kind of response kind of a thing, they have the capacity to look at information that's been developed, identify where the gaps are and where additional information is needed, and might be able to try to uh, more aggressively and quickly and directly address some of the most critical comments found in the, in the report. Um, it's been said that for a lot of these disciplines that there was plenty of scientific data out there, we just didn't collect it. One of the specific requests that was made by the National Academy of Science during the time period that they had this committee up and running and they had public sessions was they invited people to come in and actually produce the scientific data that folks were referring to. 
And I'll just use this as one small example. Under the odontology section on bite marks, uh, they reached the conclusion, quote, the committee received no evidence of an existing scientific basis for identifying an individual to the exclusion of all others, end of quote. Um, there's, a, there's another report I read which said- I'm sorry, Mr. Neufeld, um, what methodology were you, were you referring to there? Uh, the odontology bite marks section um, for, for illustrative purposes. Um, there was a lot of talk even in the report that a lot of these problems were known about back in 1999 when NIJ did a study and at another report that was done in 1995 and one done in 2003. And I think it is short-sighted if we simply believe that we can quickly deal with a couple of these problems and then things will be okay. When I read this report, the one thing I walk away with is that it won't be okay. That in fact what they're saying is because no one has ever demonstrated the will or the vision to do these things before, that you really do need a single entity, which they call a National Institute of Forensic Science, that can coordinate all these objectives. Yes, once that is up and running, they can prioritize. They can decide that, for instance, some of the disciplines that Mr. Hicks and Dr. Downs were referring to are the ones that need to be addressed first. But you still need this national entity that can look at the financial needs, for instance, of all the various crime laboratories that uh, uh, Pete Marone was talking about. One of the fundamental problems we've seen in forensic science, and I don't think there'd be any disagreement uh, uh, in this panel, is there's been a kind of balkanization of forensic science in America. So people have to go to 20 different pots. People have to deal with 20 different organizations. And it would be much better if there was a single entity that could coordinate all of this. Uh, and it could create its own priorities for research, for, uh, for giving out the federal money, um, for doing all those things that you would expect to do if this is to be a science-based undertaking. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The gentlelady from Maryland, Representative Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the, um, to the panel. I would say I do look forward to, at some point in the future, hearing directly from NIST about uh, some of the uh, analysis and recommendations and the way that they uh, believe they can play um, a, a, a continued role in the good work that they're doing out in the 4th Congressional District in Maryland. Um, and to Mr. Neufeld, really appreciate, and I've been pronouncing your name apparently wrong uh, since 1992, um, but I appreciate the work that you've done. I had the great f fortune um, when I was at the ARCA Foundation of being able to support some of the work of the Innocence Project and all the projects around the country looking at DNA and obviously other um, evidence that resulted in people being wrongfully convicted, uh, particularly of capital uh, crimes and, and serving uh, life terms and facing execution. And I just think that the work that you've done with this new technology has been uh, an amazing revelation into our criminal justice system and the way that it sometimes can fail um, uh, people who are sometimes are of little means and have the ability to defend themselves. So thank you very much. Um, I w have a question really that relates to funding, and while you may not be able to project um, the amount of uh, resources that it would take to do this work, I wonder if any of you have any estimates across uh, the federal landscape of the amount of resources that are already being spent in um, forensic uh, sciences and, and technology. Uh, because I think with a lot of things, it, it, we are not always in a position here in the Congress of creating a new agency because we have a new field. And um, that in itself could be uh, very expensive and maybe not even very productive. I look at the work, for example, around climate change that is actually taking place across, which is, has a number of different kinds of disciplines contributing uh, to the field and uh, taking place across many different agencies and now with some greater coordination out of the White House. And so I wonder if you could comment about a way that we can, uh, and particularly Ms. Henderson, about the way that we can look at the work that's in front of us and the recommendations, which I think are important, but that we can use some existing uh, resources or build on those capacities uh, rather than creating a separate federal, federal agency. Well, I have, I've, I think if we look at what is existing, and then we'd have to look, of course, at the 
the latest um, legislation that's out there. But you, if you have to look at different um, entities, it's going to be NIST, it's going to be NIJ. There are forensic capacities that, that are being utilized in the Department of Defense. Um, there's the Department of Homeland Security. See, that's the thing that's in, as Peter pointed out, there's many little pockets out there um, with different um, uh, resources. Um, and in fact, sometimes uh, there's, re and this goes back to what Pete said too, there's research that's being done that we in the forensic community are not privy to because it's in Department of Defense or something, and that is not out for peer review, for example. So I think if we um, look, and I think Pete, you had mentioned something about that there's like in the new economic stimulus package, there's between four and five billion, is that correct? But do you um, have an idea? Uh, um, do you have an idea across uh, federal agencies of the resources? Maybe that's something that we need to uh, to figure out to get a better handle on whether the resources that you're talking about that c would be used perhaps even to create a new agency, in fact, are already in existence. And maybe there is a way to figure out a coordinating role um, among these agencies, even the ones that are um, that are out of our our hands in some ways, like Department of Defense or um, Homeland Security. And I, th the other question sort of goes not so much to the, the funding levels, but what type of coordination um, do you think is necessary, even across the, you know, the ones that we know about, FBI, NIJ, NIST? Well, I would like to talk about that because when I was the president of the academy, one of my sub-themes was collaboration. And sometimes there isn't as much as we would hope for in the uh, forensic science community, but I think now we're all saying we must all work together. I mean, this is a diverse panel, if you look at us. Um, and we have come to the table, so to speak, because it is of such concern, both for the justice system, and I'm saying both the criminal and the civil justice system. Um, so I think what we have to do is identify all the resources that are available we all want to uh, make sure that justice, both civil and criminal, are uh, successful, and we cannot do that unless we identify what is available now. Don't duplicate efforts. I think that is a waste of everyone's time, and we have to be uh, cognizant of what our economy is looking like these days. I mean, we cannot ignore that, and we're suffering across the board here, whether we're in um, education, the Innocence Project, uh, in a crime laboratory, in you know, pathology uh, work, all of that. Um, so I would say the first thing probably to do to identify the pots of money, who's working on it, and then can we bring people to the table? Um, I don't know whether you know people have to be dragged kicking and screaming or not. I am hoping not, since I think we're all trying to collaborate at this point. And my, t my time is up, and I, I think this is something that we actually um, do need to explore, and then we can look at the set of short-term recommendations that we could follow through on right away, even though we may not be able to quite reach the, the long-term yet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Brown. I thank the chairman. Um, let me give you a little background about me. I'm a physician from Georgia, and so uh, Dr. Downs might be able to understand what I say. And if y'all need some interpretation, he'll be glad to do that, I'm sure. Uh, but um, the <laughs> Mr. Marone said that, that NIST does not have all the package. And I'm concerned. Um, I'd like to see a show of hands please, uh, some of you seem to be promoting a, national, a new National Bureau of Forensic Science or, or new agency. Who of y'all's group are proposing a new National Bureau? Would you sh please r raise your hands? Okay, three, four, one, not. Okay, uh, of the four that are proposing a new National Bureau. Why not in the private sector? Why not in the states? Uh, why, why can't this be done? Because I'm, as a scientist, seeking truth all the time. When I graduated from medical school, the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta, I was taught things as being absolutely true. Three or four years later, through continuing medical education, I found the opposite is true. And, I can give you many examples of that, and that's true with all of science, and we have to have peer review, and we have to have the independence that Ms. Henderson was describing, and having that independence is extremely important as far as I'm concerned to make sure that we don't convict people who are not guilty. I want to put the guilty folks in jail and make them pay for the crimes. I want to make sure that people not guilty 
are, are exonerated if they're charged. So why not do this in the private sector? We've got two competing forces here. The, the, uh, the district attorneys, the prosecutors on one hand, the, the um, defense attorneys on the other, with a lot of money involved on both sides at the local and state level. Why not allow market forces to develop this kind of scientific inquiry to find the truth and the new truths as it, as it develops? Mr. Hicks. Well, I think the, uh, again, because this is driven by, typically by the DAs, I mean, they're the ones that, are, and the police investigators at the crime scene, they're the ones that are, uh, have the needs to try to gather the kind of information that'll help, again, reconstruct the event, establish a legal element of the crime, maybe link the suspect and the victim together. So it seems to me that's where the need is going to be defined. and. Uh, and then whether or not you can turn that to the uh, private sector, I think you probably could. And I think maybe that's where NIST actually uh, does, uh, is kind of uniquely positioned because they are involved in the private sector to a great extent. And, um, and it just strikes me that uh, as, uh, I if given this role in, um, with respect to the um, forensic activities, as, as these new needs are defined and emerge, they may recognize opportunities in the private sector that can be brought to bear on those. And of course, just as with DNA technology, while the, the um, significance of the technology was recognized early on, but having the reagents, the testing equipment, all the supplies necessary for performance laboratory, that all had to be communicated to the private sector. And so there was a, uh, you know, a lot of interaction there at that time. The private sector was eager to find out what the needs were because I think they too recognized the uh, potential there for growth in that area. Thank you, Mr. Hicks. I'd like to ask another show of hands. Who of y'all uh, of the panel have, have read and studied the Constitution of the United States? Could I see hands? Okay. Four or five of you? I carry a copy in my pocket, and I believe in this document as it was intended by our founding fathers. Could y'all show me somewhere in this document where we should develop a new bureau or or agency of forensic medicine or forensic science here in the United States. If y'all could show me that, I'd appreciate it. Actually, Peter would probably say something. We could look for a penumbra, right, for a shadow within some of the constitutional amendments that say that we, um, to protect people's rights, that we would be able to have something like this. No, Peter? Congressman, I, if I may, I also wish to respond to your last question, because I think you raised a very good question. Uh, and I actually do believe that the private sector can play a huge role in, in doing a lot of the research that you're describing. But the one overarching principle that came out of this report, and I think there's no disagreement on this panel, is that whatever fixes need to happen have to, have to, have to happen upstream of a courtroom. That historically, defense lawyers, prosecutors and judges have not done a very satisfying job of separating the wheat from the chaff when it comes to good science and bad science in criminal cases. I'd be more than happy to send you a peer-reviewed article that I wrote last year uh, on that specific subject. And what you'll see is that uh, uh, even the, the, the very famous Daubert decision that came down in 1992 is not, ra is not really used uh, in criminal cases, very, very rarely and that uh, it's, it's believed by everybody here that if you can get this stuff right before it ever gets into a courtroom, then we can all have much more confidence in what goes on. And you can't simply leave it to the, uh, to the so-called crucible of the courtroom to work it out. Mr. So, Oldfellow, well, I pres appreciate that. My time's about out. If the chairman would just permit me to, to, to make a statement, then I'll quit. Um, Back to my question about the Constitution, unless you look at a perverted sense of the Constitution, you will not find in that document anywhere constitutional authority to develop a new national agency or department of, of forensic science. You won't find it. But we're operating here on a perverted idea in Congress. The courts, as well as the administration, whether it's Republican or Democrat, all seem to operate on a perverted idea of what the Constitution's all about. And I'm, I find that very regrettable. But as a scientist, I'm extremely interested in finding truth, whether it's in forensic medicine, uh, forensic science, just human medicine as I practice, still practice, or not. But um, I don't think we're going to have the, the intellectual 
freedom with a government, new government body because there's going to be government control over that body. And I encourage you to think long and hard before continuing to promote a national body. NIST does a great job of setting standards, and I think we have other opportunities to develop uh, truth in the forensic areas and, uh, without developing a new body. And we frankly don't have the money now to develop these new standards. So I encourage you and others to, to look at, at um, we've got to solve the economic problem of America and developing new bodies and new bureaus and uh, other uh, things, though maybe they're nice and maybe they're, they uh, are not constitutional, but we would want to do that. Um, I think there are better ways than trying to look at that. And let's find those solutions, because I don't want anybody sitting in jail who's not guilty. And I want to know the truth as a physician. So um, I have other questions I'll submit for you all to answer. I appreciate you all's time, and I thank the chairman. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I'm sure that we'll be able to get back to you on a, a second round of questions, if you'd like. And I'd like to thank the gentleman from Georgia for giving me the opportunity to pull out my hip pocket uh, copy of the Constitution. Um, and um, the argument is typically that Ar Article 1, Section 8 provides various authorities. Uh, there is a specific authorizing provision in the Constitution for NIST uh, to provide a, si a system of weights and measures for the country. But I just want to point out, because this issue has come up uh, in my congressional district repeatedly, usually with respect to Social Security or Medicare, uh, about constitutional authority, I just want to point out that there doesn't appear to be textual reference uh, to NASA uh, or to the Air Force uh, in the Constitution either, uh, but we have sought, we have seen fit to stretch uh, in each instance, and this is not to engage the gentleman in constitutional debate at this point, but we perhaps could continue the conversation over lunch sometime. Well, I, if the chairman would yield a moment. I would be happy to yield. Uh, I would love to have that opportunity to have lunch with you and, uh, and discuss that. But from my perspective, we are operating on the, governmentally in the Congress, pretty much throughout the Congress, as well as in the federal court system and, and as well as in the administration on a perverted idea of what the Constitution is all about. And I believe in the original intent of the Constitution. National defense is, is constitutional, so there for the Air Force and NASA and some of those other things that are in, uh, were not specifically mentioned, fall within, within the aegis of, of national security and national defense. NIST certainly is one of those things that, that I agree. We need to have those national standards, and that's the reason I'd like to see NIST take over some of these things to make sure that the science is correct. Uh, but um, here in this committee throughout Congress, we, we hear people talk about the climate change and global warming that is absolutely certain, man-made, and, and there are many, many scientists across the world who, who, who say that's absolutely not true. And uh, there are scientists who look at all things in medicine, my field, and others, and uh, there's always debate. And that debate is good in the scientific community because that's what peer review is all about. And I think it would be critical to, for us to continue in the forensic science back to this issue so that we have that independence and have many entities looking at these various things, whether it's DNA testing or bite marks or other things entities so that we get the truth and continue to seek that truth. Uh, having one body, federal body, that is f focused on this is, I think, counter to good scientific inquiry. And uh, besides being un unconstitutional, in my opinion, so let's have lunch and we'll talk about that further. Thank I, you. I thank the gentleman. I thank the chairman. Re reclaiming my time. Um, while um, the gentleman from Georgia and I may have slightly different constitutional interpretations. Uh, I think we share a concern about whether the creation of a new agency at this point in time is the appropriate response, and I'd like to get to that um, after we return to mining the subject of the core concern about 
is there sufficient science? Where is the science behind forensic science? What difference does it make? Um, I am st I'm still trying to understand the core concern here, and forgive me if I'm a little bit slow, but uh, it, it appears to me that with DNA evidence, we had a body of science that was developed independently of any forensic application, and then a forensic ap application was found and eventually solidified. But DNA is something that we've been working on since the 1950s, maybe even a little bit before. Um, but there's an independent body of work. What Mr. Hicks seems to indicate uh, is that a lot of the methodology developed in forensics uh, stems from investigative work and is experiential and a body of work that developed over time and pieces of it have been subject, pieces of it are supported by research. Other pieces remain perhaps more experiential. A am I beginning to understand the, the picture uh, here? Mr. Hicks, would you care to explain? Yes, I on think that? you've hit it right on the head. That's exactly right. And uh, the, um, and, and as uh, Peter mentioned earlier, I, I, don't, I don't know what the response was when they invited uh, those practitioners in those fields to come forward with information. I suspect if they didn't, I suspect part of, part of it may have been the issue of trust and, and a question about uh, where is this going, who are we giving it to, and uh, and the other qu and knowing that they operate in a very adversarial environment of the courtroom all the time. Uh, but the other is that it may just not have been in the sort of the uh, more formal scientific form that uh, they would have been looking for as well. And that's where I th again I think people who are trained and have the experience in that type of uh, activity. Uh, if that could be brought to bear on the existing information, then there, there will be gaps, I'm sure, identified and holes identified. Can and then we they try to bear down on the issue of what difference would it make? Now, Mr. Neufeld gave a very graphic example of what 200 uh, innocent individuals, exonerated by DNA, let's say, uh, at, uh, who, who were convicted, subsequently exonerated, and out of those 200, uh, perhaps 100 perpetrators who were, if you will, loose in the streets uh, because of the wrongful incarceration of the 200, that 100 uh, real perpetrators, if you will, were, 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 were loose longer. I mean, that is one graphic example of a difference that it would make. There seems to be different levels of challenge as to different testing methods, whether it's ballistics or bite marks or hair or paint chip analysis, can, can, you f can the panel further address for me examples of what difference it might or might not make to the judicial process if we were to apply uh, science more broadly uh, to what has historically been um, a collection of experiential uh, data points? Mr. Chairman, if I could respond. One thing, and I think Peter pointed this out also, we have to remember in the criminal justice system, um, only two to four percent of the cases ever go to trial. Uh, so we want to make sure that, so we're not really um, able to cross-examine and challenge um, many of these issues because things are pled out, there's all kinds of other things that go on. I would say because we have such a diverse area in forensic science, you can say, like, Dr. Downs, pathology is not really, I don't think there's really challenges to that as much, although there's some, like, shaken baby syndrome and things like this come up as uh, theoretical debates that also are challenged in court. But then we have the pattern evidence area, and I think that's really when we look at the NAS report, they're looking at what we'd call pattern evidence. We're looking at fingerprints, we're looking at bite marks, we're looking, see, paint and things like that, we have chemistry. I mean, that, again, there's not as many, I think, um, attacks on toxicology, on uh, chemistry, drug chemistry. I mean, there's always new methodologies that are developed. Are, are most of the problems focused in these pattern areas where, where we seem to have a, if you will, a statistical problem? 
And you can't, I will say one thing that they have not, um, you can't really have statistics in some of these areas. Like um, they, there is actually in tool marks, for example, I'll give you an example. Somebody comes to pry open, you know, your sliding door and then they have someone come from the crime scene to say here, we know that this is the pry bar that we just found in this person's car to pry open that door. There, are, There's a debate whether you count striation marks. I mean, and there's two theories of this. One group says we don't need to do that. The other people say, so within, and again, that's like science. You're always debating in science, coming up with new methodologies. So there are actually, and like Pete pointed out with the um, knife um, patterns, we had, that's another one. There's, uh, they have all kinds of pattern evidence with tool marks, but it is hotly debated. So I think where why I saw, at least when I read the whole report, the more of the challenges are in the area of what I would call pattern recognition forensic science, but not in some of, I would say, um, forensic pathology, toxicology, drug chemistry, and areas like that. And I don't think that's really where the concentration was in the report. Okay, help, help me understand that. Um, where there are things like toxicology reports on chemical analysis of paint chips, uh, do you all agree that that those th those are more settled procedures and and less doubt about them, Mr. Neufeld? Mm -hmm. I agree with your original comment that the biggest problems occur in those uh, so-called uh, matching disciplines and pattern disciplines, um, but there are other types of problems in the way that they're actually implemented in the criminal justice system, which you should be made aware of, which are in the NAS report. For instance, since most cases don't involve DNA, we all agree on that, and we all agree that most cases don't go to trial. Most cases are either dismissed or resolved by a plea of guilty. And so therefore, in most cases, uh, the people who are the principals, the lawyers and the defendant uh, and the victim are looking at a lab report, a piece of paper. And uh, there are no national standards on what goes into a lab report. And uh, one of the things that the NAS report calls for is there needs to be national standards so whoever reads the report can figure out what happened. So even where there is, uh, if you will, more science, as in uh, uh, chemistry, uh, there, there are certification issues uh, about the accuracy of the lab tests. There are issues about procedure, there are issues about the format and the content of various reports. That's, that's correct. Thank you. And nobody disagrees with that. But is there, is there still consensus that uh, there, there's a much bigger problem in the pattern recognition fields like ballistics, bite marks, fingerprints? Dr. Downs. I think what we're looking at is a couple of issues that overlap. One is the, the fundamental scientific testing, the reproducible number. And I'm going to probably get my uh, good friend, uh, Mr. Neufeld, upset, but he refers to DNA exonerations. To my knowledge, DNA has never exonerated anyone. It has been used for that purpose, but it is only a test result. And we have to place that test result into context. DNA has never convicted anyone. It's been used and interpreted for that purpose. But what we're talking about is the metric of actually performing a scientific test. Mm -hmm. The accreditation and certification goes to the scientist, the practitioner, that they are actually qualified to interpret that test result and put it into the context. So I think that part of the report, you need to have both of those together simultaneously because the reports need to be understood. They need to be understandable. Uh, someone needs to be able to read my report and understand why I made a determination. Well, well Dr. Downs, I think that we're in agreement that uh, if there is a sound methodology, one still has to have a sound practitioner and have standards for the form of the report and the content of the report. Yes, sir. It, it, so so we're, in a, we're in agreement on that, and there's a, there's a certification issue here and a standard set, uh, uh, setting set of issues. But I, I'm trying to get back to, are, are there core issues with some of these uh, technologies that we use that have a deep history, uh, but perhaps have not been analyzed in, in ways that, uh, uh, that, that we would 
uh, consider supported by your lab science? I would Ms. like Hendrickson. to, yes, um, actually this brings up another issue which I wanted to touch on is it's can, education. Can, can we finish this one first? Yes, well that's where I'm getting, I'm, I'm going in a circular fashion right now. Um, no, actually but it's education because lawyers for a long time, these things weren't challenged because lawyers did not have science backgrounds. Only 5.3% of law students have any education in physical sciences. So now that people who are getting, I would say, up to speed in whether it's computer science or something else, now there are many more challenges that are being made. And for a long time, fingerprints were never challenged. Tool marks were never challenged. It was a given that this is good science. But then when people started asking, well, where's the rigor? Where is, and they have a very famous case that took place in Philadelphia with um, a fingerprint. It's the first time that somebody in federal court challenged a fingerprint, and this was in a bank robbery case. And all of a sudden people said, well, where is the data? We don't have anything that supports that the fingerprint evidence is really valid. So I think that's where we're looking, and these are many cases, I mean, if, if you go to my website, all right, ncstl.org, we have cataloged all these types of cases that say, here's where the challenges are. Um, and that's, again, I think really what we're seeing is the challenges are being made in things that, as John said, developed through law enforcement but then didn't have the rigor till the attorneys started getting educated, and they're still not that well educated, I have to say, in, in most science, other than Peter Neufeld, of course. Um, but you know, that's one of the things, and he's been doing this for years, but other people are not being trained in that particular area. So I think the rigor needs to be imposed in many of, I would say, traditionally accepted pattern evidence areas, and that's what the report, pardon me, that's what the report says. Uh, uh, Ms. Henderson, uh, Mr. Hicks, uh, Mr. Hicks, you headed up the FBI crime lab. Uh, have we just been taking on faith this fingerprint matches, this bite mark matches, and if you, if you drill down to really focus on is there evidence that a match is a match, do, do, do we have problems when we actually drill down and start asking those questions? Well, of course, I'm not an expert in all those areas, you know, and, and to that extent, but the um but it is experientially based, and I think uh, if you were to speak with someone who has worked in a, that field for some period of time, they have confidence that they're able to distinguish. But again, there's so many uncertainties in an actual forensic evidence case. So, for example, with a fingerprint, you may not have a full, clear image. You may right. Have I mean, a full fingerprint is a full fingerprint, but the problem is right. you're frequently working with something a lot less than that. What you're faced with, right. And so that's where the, as Pete mentioned earlier about the quality assurance practices, where you do want to be sure that you have some level of redundancy in your analytical system. You have a confirmation process, maybe where somebody else looks at it and verifies, at the very least, reviews the work done to, uh, to agree that they come to the same opinion. And can errors happen? I think they can, as has been demonstrated, and, uh, and undoubtedly will in the future, even with errors happen in medicine with all the rigor that's behind that. Uh, but uh, so I, I think that's where the quality control process and accreditation process, of course, supports that, uh, to be sure that you have systems in place that help to detect when things go wrong and are inconsistent. Uh, you know, what the, what the, what the uh, sort of established community standard is. I think if you were to go, I, I mentioned scientific working groups earlier. I think you go to the FBI website, for example, and, and look at some of their publications. Um, Crime Laboratory Digest, for example, is one of those publications, and you'll find on there listings of recommended guidelines for fiber identification, for example, fiber uh, matching, and it'll go to the level of what should be included in the report. It'll talk about the kinds of tests which should be at least considered and applied, although not all tests would apply in all circumstances, but uh, it at least it defines which test will provide certain elements of information that might help to uh, resolve whatever question is they've been put to. M Mr. Hicks, in those fields where the FBI does have guidelines, uh, in, in your professional experience, what percentage of tests submitted in those fields where there are guidelines do you think actually meet those guidelines? I'm reluctant to even hazard a guess. I, I, I don't know. It's been, first with the FBI, it's been a long time since I've been there. Much has changed in the last uh, 10 or 15 years at the FBI. And uh, as, in, as in all laboratories, the entire community, in part because of the DNA experience. Yeah, this is why we're spending a bit of time on this, mm -hmm. because frequently when you focus down on an area, and as a legislator, I don't uh, get to do that nearly as often as I want to. 
uh, what's there is not what one fully expects. And right. uh, many of us strive for original intent or for truth, but it's a little bit slipperier uh, than, than being able to get it on the first pass. And uh, I, I, I guess uh, even though I didn't, I don't think I've ever seen the TV show, I, I perhaps fell in the same trap of, uh, of uh, assuming that because folks said it was so, it, it must be so. And uh, I'm beginning to wonder if, if it ain't so uh, and, and whether we should be asking that question more consistently. Well, I think it's, again, it's a question of being in the form that's expected. And, uh, and that's, again, why I keep getting back to NIST. I mean, they have the competencies to help make that assessment, to look at the kind of information, working with the laboratories and these scientific working groups of experts in those individual fields, people that are at least practitioners in the field, to draw together what information is there and, and put it to that kind of scrutiny. And I, I suspect that there'll be many areas where they can find that there are some gaps that need to be, to be filled. Uh, some areas might just be simply a matter of um, conducting, refining the scope of the study and, and performing the study in a slightly different way to get to the very specific questions being asked. Well, I, I want to get to the other members for another round, and, 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 and I will continue this. But I just want to comment that it disturbed me greatly when I made the transition from uh, a science background to law school. And then it took me a while to figure out how the paradigm had shifted. Uh, because in science, you kind of work at something and you have competing hypotheses until you collect the data. You don't draw a conclusion about which of the competing hypotheses um, one should proceed upon. With law, with judicial process, or the legislative process, it's really quite different. There's a deadline, and there's a deadline for decision. There is procedural fairness, but one has to reach a decision by the deadline. And you make the best choice you can under the procedural rules and then you live with that decision until you collect, until something else comes back and you you, you reverse it. It was v it was very unsettling to come to that conclusion. I'm still not sure that I'm fully comfortable with it, but I'm not sure that there's any way to proceed in our society without those deadlines. Uh, I'm still going to come back to this topic before getting to a few crass administrative things like cost and transitional issues. Mr. Smith, um, you've been very patient. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I, I find this interesting and appreciate the expertise uh, that you bring. That's, I think, why we have these uh, hearings, and I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate. We've got progress of science, and we've got a criminal justice system. Are they keeping up with each other? Uh, I mean, uh, Mr. Neufeld, you, you cited over 200 cases, and I, I certainly commend your organization uh, for striving uh, for a, a better way, uh, if, if you will. Um, if we used today's system that is most often practiced, I mean, each state would probably have a little different way of doing things, but if we applied today's practices to those cases over the last several years, I'm not uh, real certain with the timeline of all of those cases that you mentioned, but have we made progress? How are we doing, say, from the 40,000-foot uh, level? Um, you've made progress with respect to those cases which would be resolved through DNA testing, but as because DNA is that robust. But again, as everybody on this panel will tell you, uh, uh, the types of cases which lend themselves to DNA is a very small minority of what goes on in a crime laboratory or what goes on in the broader area called forensic science. Uh, many of the same disciplines that gave rise to the wrongful convictions are still practiced today, and they're still practiced today much the same way they were practiced 5 or 10 or 15 years ago. They haven't changed, and that's one of the reasons why there is concern for a new initiative, because others before have failed to have that initiative to make the changes. Okay, people knew, for instance, uh, uh, you know, and I'm not going to, uh, John Hicks was an expert in hair microscopy, which the chairman asked him about. Uh, that is looking at hairs under a microscope, a hair from a crime scene and comparing with a hair or hairs from a suspect and seeing whether they're similar. 
they would look at, you know, perhaps a dozen or more variables, and I will defer to him on what the exact number is. But the problem is they never had any empirical data as to how, how common or rare each of those variables were. Nevertheless, they would make statements in courts of law about how unusual it is to find two things that are similar or common without any database, without any empirical data. And to a large extent, the problem with a lot of these so-called matching disciplines is they lack empirical databases to allow people to create a statement about an association. And that's still a problem today. It hasn't changed. And uh, it's not getting any better in the courts because judges don't deal with it any more adequately. And the lawyers, namely the defense lawyers and prosecutors, don't deal with it any more adequately because if they had done well in organic chemistry, they would have followed Mr. Wu to medical school as opposed to me to law school. <laughs> it's that simple. Okay. And, and Go ahead. Well, uh, again, uh, the, um, with hair identification, you're looking at features that, are, that um, may help to distinguish one person from another, but always in the reports that were issued, there was a, a disclaimer, more or less, a warning statement put in there that this is not an absolute means of identification, and, uh, and so it should be viewed in, in that light. Uh, there may have been circumstances if a hair had been artificially treated, for example, repeatedly, where it would add some level of uniqueness, at least so in the experience of the examiner, it would seem to be something that they had rarely observed, and uh, that might be offered during the course of testimony there to, uh, to but I, I think in, I'm, I'm not aware of any instance where it was, there was testimony given in the hair case, uh, maybe Peter knows some, but uh, some instance where it was given that this is an absolute match. and that nobody else. It was always considered, urged that it be considered in the context of other information. And so, for example, in some cases, it might have been a fiber case, for example. Uh, if you find a blue nylon fiber uh, on, a, on a victim, on a homicide victim, and you find a suspect that has a blue nylon sweater, uh, that may be some association. But of course, there are many uh, sweaters that might have been produced like that. So it, uh, that I think intuitively most people would recognize that and wouldn't have difficulty uh, understanding that that's not an absolute association. On the other hand, if you have a case as in Georgia, uh, the Wayne Williams case some years ago, uh, the Atlanta murders case it was referred to, where there were a number of young uh, men who were found killed and there were many different fiber types that were found and 28 different fiber types in fact that were consistently found on the homicide victims and there was at the suspect that was eventually developed uh, sources for those fiber types were found in one location. Now, was it an absolute uh, identification? I don't think so. There was an effort to try to develop some, some statistical estimate of how likely it might be that that uh, type of a circumstance might occur. But that's the challenge, again, in forensics. You don't know what you're going to be presented with, and again, with the whole idea is to try to assess and reconstruct what you're observing and to see if it might uh, help bear light on a particular investigation, particularly either to corroborate or dispute uh, eyewitness testimony that you may have or other facts and circumstances that you have. It should always be considered in the context of the whole case. And I think that's what you had gotten to earlier, I guess. Of course, that's sort of the legal requirement is to look at the uh, totality of things and assess whether or not you can come to and make your best decision based on the information you have. In some respects, uh, that's taking place to some extent in some of those types of uh, experiential types of uh, practices in some forensic labs. On the other hand, hair identification, the cases that Peter's referring to where they had success in reversing these convictions, those are convictions which occurred 15 or 20 years ago prior to the advent of DNA technology typically. Uh, if you were to look at a forensic laboratory today, I suspect there are a few that actually uh, end with the microscopic uh, observation of hair features of a hair. Now they would typically use that only to identify hairs which might be good candidates for DNA analysis. So rather than analyze 20 different hairs recovered in the debris from a crime scene, they'll focus on one or two that seem to have be similar in appearance maybe to the hair from the suspect source that they're considering. And, uh, but then uh, they would then isolate those hairs that look to be the best candidates for a potential DNA match and then pass that on for DNA confirmation. But you know what, but actually it's, it, it, it proves too much because even when you talk about a combination between hair and mitochondrial DNA, you have the National Academy of Science explicitly reporting at page 5-26 uh, of their report, but no studies have been performed referring to mitochondria working with hair microscopy specifically to quantify the reliability of their joint use. The problem is 
frankly, there are dozens of cases that we have where people were wrongly convicted based on the inappropriate use of statistics in those hair microscopy cases. And sometimes it was FBI agents themselves who actually offered these statistics completely in the absence of any empirical database. That's documented in transcripts. We can share them with the panel. It's not, a, it's not at all controversial. But there's a bigger problem. Even if you don't do as we did in the case which I submitted to the panel, say giving a number of one in 10,000, even if you say that something is more likely than not to have come from this individual, that in itself, even without giving a number, is a probabilistic statement. And you can't give a probabilistic statement unless you have some empirical data. So it's not enough to say that we would have a disclaimer that we will not say it's this person to the exclusion of the rest of the world. But, but when you give any statement at all like that, that it's most likely his or more likely than not his, that's a probabilistic statement. And you can't make those kind of statements in the absence of a scientific empirical database. And they never had it. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Um, I, I thought Peter might cite to the, was it Williamson case that was in um, Oklahoma, I believe it is, or Texas? There have been cases where um, they have said something was a match with hairs and fibers, and that now they said you cannot do that. And, and it's true, John has said, there are some eval you know, evaluations, improvements now with hair and fiber evidence, but a lot of laboratories have done away with um, microscopy. They just said, we don't want to do this anymore. Instead, we're going to see if we can do mitochondrial uh, DNA testing. We'll do that on the hairs, but we are not going to go ahead and just say it is microscopically similar because there is not uh, the data. Now, one thing I wanted to point out, though, when we asked before about whether how reliable certain areas were, there was a publication in the Journal of Forensic Sciences on proficiency testing. They went back to 1978 and looked at uh, Joe Peterson is the author of this particular article, um, and he's done an update. He started in 1978 and looked at proficiency testing in every area of forensic science and how reliable some areas, and I have to say hair and fiber was one of them, you might as well have flipped a coin, 50% of the cases they made misidentifications. Um, and so that's, I think, something that, and I can provide that to the committee if they would like to look at this particular um, study. Uh, Ms. Henderson, can you explain that to me a, a little bit further? When you, I don't know what you mean by proficiency testing. Okay. And um, when you say 50% is misidentifications, T Maybe actually, tell me, I tell think, me what this means. Okay, Pete can probably talk more about proficiency testing because he does this in the laboratory. Sure. Go ahead, Pete. Uh, proficiency testing is a, a quality assurance method, if you will, that's designed to uh, uh, test, ascertain the competency of the individual examiner. We'll do that. Uh, uh, each drug chemist, every year, accredited laboratories must go through a proficiency testing program. For example, every drug chemist is given an unknown they have to identify what it is. That could either be from an external source or an internal source, but they don't know what the, what the, what the outcome is. Uh, and it's the same thing for trace evidence. For uh, uh, DNA folks, they'll get a stain. Identify the stain. Tell us what the profile is. Is there semen present, whatever. And so what it literally is, is it's a test of the competency of, of both the individual and the operating process within the laboratory. Uh, DNA requires two a year. Everybody else gets one a year. Uh, in every discipline. <laughs> part, part, of, part of the uh, 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 process, the, the uh, proficiency testing process is to ascertain why you got the wrong answer, whatever that might be. In a lot of instances, it's something minor that you can fix. If it is an instance where you find out the person really has issues, that individual's taken off of work until uh, the, uh, the problem is fixed. And at that same time, you go back and look at other work that that person has done prior to that proficiency test to see if those issues are, 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 are seen I, I, in, those, in that case. Anderson, I, I misunderstood you because when you said when you were talking about proficiency testing and then said 50% of test results were okay. incorrect, I thought the implication was that 50% of the results submitted as evidence were incorrect. It, it, it no, this is, this is looking at proficiency testing within the laboratory, not necessarily that they made it to the courtroom if I wanted to. And again, it was in certain areas. Now this is, again, when they started in 1978 and looked at this, and move forward, we have put in place, I have to say, in the forensic community, a lot of more f 
proficiency tests than were ever done before. We also have put into place, of course, ASCLAD lab accreditation, um, which then requires these proficiency tests before many laboratories did not have these requirements. And I know Peter Neufeld will probably chime in on this at some point, um, but that's one of the things that have yeah. been improvements. I have to say things have improved um, over the years. Although I can say it's human nature, it's not perfect. I mean, yeah. these are human beings doing uh, laboratory tests. But what they're trying to do, and that's why they have quality assurance groups that go out to the laboratories and identify if there are weaknesses, perhaps, in a system. And that's the other thing that they are trying to work through. And that's something to encourage, I believe, with more funding as well. Yeah, one of the things we found out so in the to use an analogy from a different field. Ms. Henderson, what you're saying is that this is like having sanitary tests for restaurants and the restaurants fail 50% of the tests or inspections, but that's not to say that 50% of the customers are necessarily eating unsanitary food. I don't know if I'd say it that way. I, I, I have to say, I, I think, I, with all due respect, I think that's putting words in my mouth. I don't think that's really, what I'm saying is in certain areas reflected in the work by Dr. Peterson, he found that over the years, and he looked at 20 or more years of proficiency tests, that in certain areas, I don't say all areas of forensic science, but in certain areas of forensic science, um, people failed proficiency tests. Right? And that was in, the hair and fiber was one of the most, um, I'd say, telling areas of the proficiency test failures. I, I'm sorry, Ms. Henderson. You all are experts. That's why you're here. <laughs> uh, we're not. That's why we're here. Uh, and I'm just trying to understand the policy implications M of what you all are, are trying to tell us. Okay, I M think Peter can address. Mr. Wu, there's a fundamental disconnect. And the fundamental disconnect is that the reason you use proficiency tests is there is no way to know when you're looking at a piece of crime scene evidence and you match it to me did you get the right answer or the wrong answer, if you will? Because you don't have a control. It's, it's an unknown. And so proficiency tests are a substitute for that. Is that clear, kind of? That that's the fundamental difference? So for instance, when you're that looking at- That is clear. It's somewhat troubling, but it, it, it is it, clear. Well, it is very troubling. And so one of the things that you would want from a national- The Hicks does not agree. One of the things you would want from a National Institute of Forensic Science, for instance, would be to come up with a program of proficiency testing because, because there are four types of proficiency testing. They're external, they're internal, they're open, and they're blind. So a lot of the proficiency testing that's done, for instance, is the kind where the individual analyst knows it's a proficiency test and may or may not treat it the same way that he or she would actual casework. So what you would like to do ideally to make the proficiency test more challenging and more robust is be able to sort of move it into the lab system so the proficiency test looks no different than an actual case. So you get the laboratory and the personnel to treat it the same way they would a regular case. It's expensive to do that. Uh, I think we all agree with that. But hopefully, if you had this, uh, this NIFS, okay, they could create national standards. They could create, uh, if you will, national proficiency tests so the expense would not be on every laboratory, and that kind of robust proficiency testing could happen uh, more consistently throughout the country. The reason you want to do it, um, one of the problems we had, for instance, uh, you know, um, in some of these other disciplines is you can assume that you've got the right person, but you don't have the same kind of scientific control that you have with the proficiency test to tell you for sure that you have the right person. Full circle. <laughs> Back to the creation of a new agency, uh, perhaps. Do we not have a, enough of a grasp of where we need to go within the current agency framework, NIST, or however we might proceed without creating yet another new agency that I think could end up being a bit of a distraction uh, with the administrative parts of it rather than uh, ramping up with uh, current agency framework. Well, I would like to go back to my um, 
immediate action first. I think what let's take existing resources. And we do have, I want to mention, we do have um, ASCLAD Lab, which is the American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors Laboratory Accreditation Board, which also has testing methods, um, NIST has testing methods in place already. And I think then we do the interim action. So first, let's start with what we have in existence. We don't th throw out the baby with the bathwater, to use a hackneyed phrase here. But go ahead and say, what do we have? And we have to corral the existing resources. And I think um, Ms. Edwards, when she said, let's see what's out there, we need to see what is existing in terms of funding. Then let's see what federal resources we already have in terms of testing and things like that. Then we go to the interim action, which would be to evaluate strategic policy decisions and strategies. Because we need to say, what do we have here right now? And I think probably us in the forensic community would be able to probably pull all these things together and see what's out there. Then do the interim action. Then we go to the long-term action. Um, I think it has to be a three-step plan. I think that's a much um, better you know, way to exercise this, particularly in looking at policy and strategies. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, I, I asked the forbearance of the witnesses uh, in repeatedly asking this, th these questions related to um, the, the role of science of forensics and, and why it makes a difference. I think this is a topic to which we will return at some future date. I just want to say in my own defense or admission of guilt that I have been asking why does nanotechnology matter for the last 10 years because people don't seem to have good explanations about why it should be important just because it's small. Um, and uh, I have come to the conclusion that it is important and it's worth supporting. I've come to the conclusion that we're on to something here and that it deserves more focus, but I still, quite frankly, do not, I'm still trying to understand the, the role that scientific rigor can play in being brought to bear on what has been an experiential field for, for the most part. Mr. Neufeld has provided some graphic examples based on DNA, and I'm trying to understand how it might affect the rest of what we do, whether it's conviction rates going up or going down, and our certainty about uh, providing a sound service. I think that Mr. Smith has asked some good questions about uh, what would happen in the organizational interim in trying to organize a new agency if that were the path we were to choose. Uh, I want to focus on that a little bit, and uh, but first I want to start with Mr. Marone. And Mr. Marone, you said that resources are um, a real problem, but when asked specifically about how much more in resources, uh, you begged off on the question. And I want to press you a little bit on that because it's easy to come here and say we need more, and we are in the line drawing business about how much more. So if you're going to ask for more, I'm going to have to ask you how much more. Well, I, di I didn't beg off from the, from the answer of what kind of resources, how much resources, I beg off the question as to how much it's going to cost, which are two different things one could argue. But for example, if you want to look at resources and well, let's... We, we, we deal, deal with I dollar funding I understand. here, so if you could well, help us with that metric. I, I can, I can t well, I can tell you things that it's going to take. For example, we need more people. How many more people we have to assess that and find out where we are. But where does that begin? We need a better entry source for our examiners. One of the things that we're looking at is uh, uh, the forensic science applicant pool. Who do we want them to be? Do we want them to be hard science? Will we like them to be more science-based and, and, and not requiring a baccalaureate degree, as is in many instances now with fingerprint examiners, firearms examiners, and so forth? So we need to start at that level, just like Dr. Downs needs to start with if you need more people, you need to educate more people, you need to train them for, for, for pathology. You know, there are reasons why people go into other fields. We've got to make it uh, more, more uh, uh, meaningful to them, more uh, palatable to them to go into the forensic science field, to go into public service. Uh, forensic science has no uh, scholarship program, for example, like uh, in, in, in graduate school, they get a, a free ride to go uh, get a PhD. Okay, there is no such thing, even in under, in a, at a, uh, a master's level in forensic science. We need that to get the 
qualified, higher caliber students into the interest in forensic science. Well, that, that's going Mr. Merrill, what, what I think we need from you to make a case for this, I mean, is, are, are, are the measurable inputs that you need. I mean, the factors that you are mentioning are all important policy concerns, but ultimately I think you know, we have to decide what are we going to put into this, uh, what are the dollars and cents, what are the undergraduate or graduate programs, uh, what are the certification programs, what are the standards that need to be de developed. And, and, and uh, I, I hate to be so pedestrian about this, but that, I think that's what we need at, for, for action going forward. Uh, and, and, and I'd like to ask you for help with that if, if we are going to take meaningful action in this field. I, I fully understand. That's one of the things that, as a community, we have to be able to provide to you is... Yes, I, I'm asking you to provide it, and if you're saying you can't provide it today, right. uh, I, um, I, I'm saying we need to have that before we can take meaningful action. I, at least I think we need to have that before we can responsibly take meaningful action. I defer to anybody else on the panel because I know among us we've we've hammered this thing around a lot and, and I don't know that we've come up with any definitive answer. I may be able to give at least a partial answer regards medical examiners. Uh, recommendation number 11 specifically referred to the medical examiner community replacing lay coroners with physician board certified medical examiners. Yeah, and, and, and Dr. Downs, I wanted to ask you about that is in your written testimony uh, you do make that recommendation and if you look at the graduation rate for board-certified forensic pathologists, uh, which is also in your written testimony, there's just no way that we can get to having um, qualified pathologists, uh, the qualified pathologists that you want with the graduation rate that we have. Agreed. It, it's uh, staggering. We go through extensive training, as you know. Then we go into the subspecialty of forensic pathology, uh, which I did in order to cut my salary in half. So no one spoke to my wisdom in doing that, but the reality is we go into forensic pathology for a different reason mm -hmm. than perhaps other people go into medicine. It is a public service. And the, the number of people we need, we graduate 37 residents in forensic pathology a year, 37. Uh, we have 400 medical examiners actively practicing full-time. We need estimated 800. The cost per citizen, somewhere between $3 and $5 a head. So you can multiply that out. I get roughly $1 to $2 billion just to have an operating system. That doesn't get into the infrastructure of how many offices uh, need to be replaced and, quite honestly, need to be up to code for CDC uh, safety and performance of an autopsy. Um, that's we, the medical examiner side of things, the medical examiner slash coroner side of things. Right, and if we actually were to do away with this thousand, thousand year old office of the coroner, um, there are 3,000 counties out there and a fair number of them are served by coroners and I would imagine that uh, the counties would have something to say about that issue. In some places... Well, <laughs> Dr. Downs, when an institution <laughs> survived for a thousand years, there's usually a reason. Yes, sir. And the paperless office has been predicted for a long time. The papyrus has been with us a long time. There's a lot of paper up here. Yes, sir. Uh, so I, I, think, I think I get the drift of where you want to go, uh, and we ought to push in that direction, but implementing from here to there is... If we can enhance the investigation, the abilities of the coroner to do their job, I think that's a good place to start. Uh, we aren't going to get rid of the office of the coroner anytime soon, as you pointed out, sir. And I think if we can professionalize the office, we're way ahead of the game. Ms. Henderson, you make recommendations about um, substantially increasing research. Do we have the infrastructure in place to do the amount of research that you're recommending? Well, we do have um, in many universities now, because, of course, forensic science has... Uh, 
been, I guess, had increased attention. So there are different programs that are out there that have um, PhD students. That, but we can also go to other institutions. I think there's, and again, if we want to look at hard science, and that's one of the th areas to go to. Let's go to biology um, departments. We'll go to chemistry. Because all of these things can be worked not just in a forensic science program, but also in hard science programs. So I think, particularly if there's money to do research, um, I know this because I live on grant money myself, that you people will then come and do the research, again, working, I think, in conjunction with existing laboratories to know what are the needs, or with the medical examiners. Well, what, I, what I'm hearing is a mixed answer. There, there are uh, existing laboratories, state laboratories, private laboratories, federal laboratories. Uh, there's a university research base. And, and they're not always talking to each other. That's and, one of the problems. And what I don't hear you saying is that the capacity is there. I don't hear you saying that the capacity isn't there. Well, of course, I, I know that the, I think the capacity is there. Um, of course, people will say we need to have the dollars to fund it, and then I will have to get back to you with how much money we would need to fund those types of research programs. As I told you when I was in the, um, uh, in the president of the academy, one of the things we saw was there was a lack of um, research dollars within the, fe the Forensic Sciences Foundation, which is a, a, a group that actually spun off, if I could say it that way, from the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. So now what we're doing is with this $300,000 plus, we are giving uh, stipends, basically, to graduate students in these accredited forensic science programs so that they can do research and they can go present the research in peer review settings. So there has been a movement in that particular area. So I said, I think we are making many efforts in that particular area. Would it be constructive to have departments of forensic science or a new organization at the federal level to handle forensic science when this is a very important applied field, but it brings together so many, if you will, different stovepipe sections of science, whether it's metallurgy, whether it's mechanics, whether it's biology, organic chemistry, uh, or, or DNA uh, and, and biochemistry. Would, would would this be a meaningful add to try to, uh, to try to create this field, if you will? Well, we actually have, I have to say, and this is where I received some of my grant money from, is the National Institute of Justice. Mm -hmm. um, they have a science and technology section um, that has, you know, gives grants to people to do research. The Bureau of Justice Assistance um, also has money. Uh, so there are, again, existing institutions um, that do provide money for people to do significant research. And of course, NIST has been doing research over the years as well. In fact, they testified before uh, the uh, National Academy of Sciences group. So I, I think that, I don't know what creating, and again, another entity is not always a good idea. I don't know whether there could be better coordination between entities. That perhaps might work. And I don't know if you, uh, has, you know, can actually twist enough arms from uh, federal agencies in order to all work together as a collaborative venture. Well, it seems to me that this is a field that is tailor-made for our research university structure where there are disciplines from across many different fields and, and you really need to tap and access th those, those fields in order to do good work. I would not disagree with that. Yeah. Mr. Northfield? I, I would just, you know, echo the words of Recommendation 3 of the NAS report, which uh, uh, calls for um, uh, the creation of a competitively fund peer-reviewed research program that would be at this uh, National Institute of Forensic Science. They point out through uh, the two years of hearings they had that there was a terrible paucity of federal funds available for meaningful research in the forensic sciences. And certainly what you would want to have is some coordinator or quarterback who could decide what the priorities are. And even if there are pools of money at DOD or Homeland Security or other places, at least the quarterback could decide, maybe we can tap into some of those other pools of money. Uh, but at least there'll be strategic decisions made by somebody. And there's no strategic decisions being made now by anybody. Uh, when the NAS had their hearing, somebody testified, in fact, from NIJ, who was in charge of their science and technology program there, and felt that NIJ was a poor place 
uh, for locating uh, this research undertaking because of their own internal uh, perceived conflicts of interest uh, as representing the different law enforcement agencies that NIJ currently represents. Moreover, there's an historical problem at NIJ of, uh, of almost all their research money being earmarked, uh, terribly earmarked for not just uh, a discipline, but earmarked that it would take place at a particular institution, which is the antithesis of the way that the, uh, the National uh, Science Foundation works. It's the antithesis of the way the National Institute of Health works. One of the things that uh, the report recommends, for instance, is the uh, NIH should have a, uh, a research budget to help forensic pathology. So to help people who are medical examiners uh, get, get research done in the areas that are breaking into new territory, they don't even have that, okay? But if there's a quarterback somewhere who's gonna be looking out for the interest of all these people in the forensic community, then they can push the NIH to get some of that money. Then they can push uh, uh, defense or, or other agencies that have pools of money uh, to bring it to bear where it's needed. Well, Ms. Henderson, thank you for sharing your perspective uh, on Australia, that it's taken them 20 years of, of work on this. I expect that uh, as we go down this road, um, it will not be uh, a short one, uh, no matter what path we choose to take. Uh, last pass, Mr. Hicks, uh, you seem to have a different opinion about whether a new independent agency or a quarterback or anything else is needed, and I wanted to give you and, and anybody else who wants to take the other side a. Uh, a, a moment to fully, to, to more fully explore uh, whether to do that or not. Uh, what do you see as the, the downside of pr proceeding down that path? Well, I think just from the practical aspects of imp implementation, and you've already articulated, I think, uh, a lot of the concerns about trying to establish that, that large an agency. And even in conducting research, I think it's important that this be uh, community driven so that the uh, the uh, someone in an academic uh, setting who is not familiar with the ongoing operations of a, a laboratory and the kinds of questions that they need to address, uh, th there needs to be some uh, connection there so that they have a sense of uh, directing research that uh, is applicable to the, to the questions to be answered. Um, and as has already been mentioned, again, there are, have been other federal initiatives here to try to support uh, problems and needs in the forensic community, such as backlog DNA testing. And, and overall quality lab laboratory improvement. Uh, they may be vehicles that can continue to be brought to bear to help um, help improve laboratory services. It seems to me where the big gap is, as I've said repeatedly here, is that uh, in looking at some of those current currently practiced uh, uh, forensic techniques as to whether or not they meet the uh, scientific rigor and scrutiny that they will help to assure confidence in the courts. And, uh, and that's where, again, I think you, you could direct uh, activity instead of sort of open-ended research, but you could direct activity into looking specifically at some of those areas. And, um, and it's a question of where does a competency lie to try to address that right now? Do you have to build a new organization to do that, or are there competencies now that can, might be brought to bear on that question? Does any advocate for, for a new organization want to uh, take a minute to address that? or? Y'all are good. Okay, very good. Uh, Mr. Smith, okay. thank you all very much for being here today. Um, the record will remain open for additional statements and for questions and answers on the record that members of the committee uh, may ask uh, of each of the witnesses. I wanna thank you all for beginning this path at this committee level uh, to um, explore what we can do to uh, improve the state of forensic science uh, uh, in, in, in America and uh, look forward to working with you all uh, going forward. Thank you very much and uh, the, the hearing is adjourned.